How does a millennial mayor, openly gay man, win the presidency? Well, the path is narrow, but I wouldn't be doing this if I didn't see a path. And what we found is when we get in front of people, they respond. That was the first time we talked to then-Mayor Pete Buttigieg on the issue is back in March of 2019. He got in front of a whole lot of people, thanks largely to one person. Liz Smith was his top communications aide and designed a go-everywhere strategy that led to Pete becoming a national figure, now a member of the cabinet. And it led to Liz becoming one of the most talked about strategists in the Democratic Party. She writes about that and a whole lot more in her juicy new book, Any Given Tuesday, A Political Love Story. The book is out now. It's already a New York Times bestseller. Liz Smith, welcome to The Issue Is for the very first time. Congratulations on the book and great to have you in our house. Yes, thank you for having me. As you know, I um, am a big fan of your show and made sure to get Pete on here every opportunity we could when during the 2020 campaign. Yeah, he was here a lot, uh, was. more than any other candidate. We'll talk about that in a moment. I just want to say congratulations on the book. It's really, really great. Thank you. And m like you... Uh, it is honest, it is brash, it is blunt, and it's a little sassy. <laughs> <laughs> so there's definitely some tea spilled all over the pages, yes. which is what makes it fun uh, to read. But you learn a lot about it as well. Uh, some people, you write some not-so-great things about. One person you write a lot of great things about is Pete. Yeah. Uh, and you talk about him as the one. Yes. And I kept thinking about this scene from The West Wing, which is one of my favorite shows, one of Pete's favorite shows. Uh, this was when... Sam Seaborn, played by Rob Lowe, uh, was talked to by Josh Lyman, uh, played by Bradley Whitford, about checking out a potential presidential candidate. Check this out. If I see the real thing in Nashville, should I tell you about it? You won't have to. Why? You got a pretty bad poker face. Yeah. Sam, please keep your seat. Sam, where are you going? New Hampshire. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, not quite that over-the-top, Aaron sorkin -y, but but talk about sort of your, your moment when you knew that Pete was the one. Yeah, I probably maybe had a little bit of that look on my face when I first met him. <laughs> um, I first sat down with him when he was running for DNC chair in... Democratic um, National Committee. Yes, in January of 2017. I'd done phone calls with him in December of... 2016. And that was a time when Democrats were trying, thought that to beat Trump, they had to beat Trump. Um, you know, that they had to get down in the mud with him and everyone was sort of yelling and screaming on cable news and seeing who could be the most offensive and loud. Pete had a very different strategy from the beginning. Um, and his whole strategy was rooted in talking about his values, like freedom and fairness, but also in avoiding the demonization of other people. And he, his gamble was that voters would look for someone who was the complete opposite of Donald Trump. And so he radiated kindness, empathy, you know, he was brilliant, spoke seven, language, seven languages, and I just found him to be the most compelling communicator I'd ever encountered in the Democratic Party. And so that's why I did name my chapter about him the one. Yeah, and then your strategy for him was this go-everywhere strategy. You talked about it. He came on this show more than any other yeah. candidate, which we were appreciative of. And he went on a whole lot of other shows more than any other candidate as well. You were well known for that strategy. Does that strategy, that go-everywhere strategy, work if you don't have a candidate who speaks seven languages and is especially good at this stuff? Would you advise that to every one to get out there more? Or do you just have to be sort of a superhuman kind of person to pull that off? Um, no, I would not advise it for everyone. And I think sometimes people give me a little bit too much credit for this. Yes, it was my strategy, but it couldn't have happened without Pete. And Pete is a once in a generation um, communicate once in a generation talented communicator and he's the Democrats most talented TV communicator. And that's why you see the administration using him so much. But, you know, what's also kind of interesting is that the administration itself has not adopted this strategy. Joe Biden, Kamala Harris barely do any interviews. You don't see them out there, even though they have some good things to talk about, especially recently. Do you think that the White House should adopt more of that strategy, that the president and vice president should be more out there talking to people in the press. So my understanding is that after the president does bill signings next week, you know, they just had a rash, of, a run of these um, legislative victories, that he 
the vice president and the cabinet members are going to fan out across the country and be um, communicating aggressively on the accomplishments. Because in the last two weeks, we've seen them pass a number of bills, um, including hopefully rec reconciliation this weekend, which will lower prescription drug prices and make historic investments in climate. But you think so far, is that an analogy that maybe the strategy right now isn't quite working and they got to get out there more? Um, I, look, I think it never hurts to get out there more. And presidents do oftentimes rely on a rose garden strategy. But when Joe Biden is at his best is when he's actually with people because he is a people person. He's a very warm and empathetic person. So I would love to see him out there more on the campaign trail and less behind a podium at the White House. Well, let's talk a, a little bit more about the book. Um, at one point, you sort of became part of the news, even though you're so used to being behind the scenes. This is when you're dating Elliot Spitzer, um, who at that point uh, was no longer with his wife. It was a consensual relationship between the two of you. It got lots of attention in the New York Post, became a whole tablet thing in New York. Um, obviously, he got caught up in a prostitution scandal, which ended his time as, as governor of New York. And you write about the fact that you were trying to do your own PR through a crisis. Right. And you learned you can't do that. No, you can't. Um, and, and one thing about this book is I'm very honest about other people and their shortcomings. Um, that's even an understatement. So I thought it was really important to be honest about myself and my own shortcomings. Because yes, I am known as this like hardened PR pro, crisis professional. But when it came to handling my own Crisis, I did a piss poor job of it. And what I realized is you can't handle your own PR. You are inherently conflicted. And that was a moment when I needed to take a step back and rely on other people to do it and to, you know, maybe for once realize that I alone couldn't fix it. Ah, which is, of course, a <laughs> reference to President Trump who said, I alone can fix it. Uh, you know, at, at the time, you were working for Bill de Blasio, yes. uh, who was going to become the next mayor of New York, and he fired you because of this scandal. Yeah. Um, and you wrote about him in the book, um, and weren't a lot of kind words. Here's some of what you wrote about, about Bill de Blasio, who was at one point seeking Elliot Spitzer's endorsement. Uh, quote, the likely incoming mayor of New York was childish, intellectually lazy, overconfident in his own abilities, and annoyingly condescending. Both of us had tried to get in bed with Elliot, but only one of us had been successful. Ouch. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I, the best advice I got when I was writing my book was to be honest, and everything I said there was 100% truthful. So uh, is, is uh, de Blasio writing a blurb? Is he a big fan of that? No, I, from what I've heard, he's not a fan of the book, but... I think maybe it is because it hits a little close to home for him. Yeah, you know, the, you write about so many politicians, not only Pete, not only de Blasio. I, I wish I had two hours to get into all of it. Uh, that's why you got to buy the book. But we do something called the name game on our show. This is a sort of quick way to get through a lot of the different candidates. These are all people that you've worked with before. The first word uh -oh. that comes to mind when you think of them. Okay, okay, you ready? First one is Barack Obama. Star. Uh, former Missouri can uh, Senator Claire McCaskill. Brassy. Former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe. Life of the party. Former New Jersey Governor John Corzine. A very intelligent. Former North Carolina Senator and VP candidate John Edwards. Massive disappointment. Former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. Tragic. And finally, former New York mayor, Bill de Blasio. Childish, intellectually lazy, overconfident in his abilities. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> All right. Up next, could Gavin Newsom be president someday? We'll talk about his political future, what he's doing right now, the future of Dems in the midterms. Liz Smith has some advice for Democrats. Stay with us more with Liz Smith when we come back here on The Issue List. I've tried to say no, no way, in every way I possibly can. That was Governor Newsom with us here on The Issue Is at the White House, denying that he wants to run for president, but he continues to campaign against the actions of other red states' governors, leading to lots of speculation about a potential uh, presidential run. This week he's going after uh, Hollywood, saying that... Uh, Playpool should not film in other red states. Uh, we're back with Democratic strategist Liz Smith, author of Any Given Tuesday, 
a great political book. Uh, Liz, what do you make of Governor Newsom's moves here? Does this make sense in terms of a political strategy? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, he had that blowout win in the recall. Um, and as a Democrat, I would personally like to see more governors out there on the national stage and accomplished governors like Gavin Newsom. So I think he's got a great message and he's a great voice to counteract the extremism that we're seeing from Republican governors. And I know he's got that big war chest and I would just hope that maybe he uses it to help elect Dems in some of the, what, these battleground states. Meaning not potentially run for president? No, he, look, <laughs> look if, if he wants to run for president, he absolutely should. I mean, it's my belief that Joe Biden is going to run in 2024 yeah. and win in 2024, but um, it's a free country. Everyone should run for president but, if they want to. But do you think it's a, this is like a smart strategy if, you're, if you want to eventually be president to do what he's doing right now? Absolutely. You know, um, he's earned the right to go out there and try to raise his national profile, and he's the governor of the biggest state in the country, and he's racked up quite a number of legislative wins, and our party does need more leaders who aren't steeped in the culture of Washington, D.C. Um, I want to ask a question about Pete Buttigieg and his future, which I know you don't want to say very much about because it could send people in the wrong direction. But I, I had a question just conceptually about him. Yeah. Because you write about the fact that he is not this sort of huge, crazy, big figure in the room the way that, like, your old boss, Terry McAuliffe, the former right. Virginia governor, is. Just somebody who sort of walks out and encompasses everything. He's a little bit more introverted, cerebral. Um, do you think that that sort of personality can be the president? Because when you think of so many of our presidents that we've had from both parties, whether it be Bill Clinton or Donald Trump, you know, they're, they're big, huge personalities. Yeah, no, I, I do. Um, and what we saw on the campaign trail was that people really responded well to it. And it, when you went to the rallies, you might not have expected it, but he did sort of get this rock star reception. Right. When he'd walk out in, in the smoke and high hopes playing and all of that. But, you know, being thoughtful, being cerebral is maybe some, something that we could use a little more of in the White House. Let's talk about the, the Democrats' strategy going forward right now because okay. we've got this midterm election coming up yeah. right uh last few weeks have actually been a lot of good news for democrats yeah. uh, the assumption all year has been the democrats are going to get blown out in november right how do you counteract that what's your advice to the party what should the message be for the next few months yeah so the, uh, the landscape has shifted significantly over the last couple months and i would attribute that mostly to the Dobbs decision, a little bit to the mass shootings, which, unlike, you know, in the past, have not faded from the headlines. Yeah, and the um, Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade. Right, exactly. Yeah. And we saw in Kansas that it really juiced turnout among voters. And on Tuesday, Kansas voters um, voted on a provision whether to protect abortion rights in Kansas. And we saw um, voters in both red areas and blue areas turn out to support it. So that um, highlights to me that that is going to backfire on Republicans. The most important thing, though, for Democrats to do is not let this be a referendum on Joe Biden. With all of his accomplishments, with all of his accomplishments, the American people are still feeling pain from inflation and gas prices. And what we need to do is make this a choice. And it's a choice between Democrats who are trying to give him relief and Republicans who vote after, um, who vote against important measure after important measure, whether it's reducing drug prices, capping the price of insulin, um, uh, stopping oil companies from price gouging, you name it. And why are they doing that? These are not exactly radical socialist things. The only reason why Republicans are doing that is because they want to impose as much misery on the American people so that the American pe people take it out on the party in power in November. And I think it is a very cynical, uh, dark ploy that Democrats need to be screaming from the rooftops about. Are you worried that some Democrats may be so focused on sort of a purity test, that something that Barack Obama has talked about before, that they don't all get together and fight the bigger enemy, which is Donald Trump, and Republicans going forward and that they maybe stay home, especially some on the progressive left? Uh, yeah, that is a concern of mine. It, it has dissipated a bit after Dobbs because I really think it is hard um, for Democrats who maybe are, feel a little disillusioned or let down by Joe Biden to sit on their hands in November when women's rights and women's health care rights are on the ballot. So I think Dobbs has, has um, 
dissipated that a bit. But yeah, overall, I think we need to get the team together a little bit and, and understand too, when we talk about purity tests that um, not every Democrat is gonna look the, the same. There's more than one way to be a Democrat. And so we need to support candidates like Tim Ryan in Ohio and John Fetterman in Pennsylvania, even though they don't check every single political purity box on the left. All right, we like to play a game on this show called Personal Issues to get to know you a little bit better. Ooh, your book, I got a lot of personal issues. Uh, I, I, apparently, uh, if you read the book, you get to read many of them. Uh, but uh, <laughs> since I'm not doing Liz's therapy session, we're just gonna focus on uh, your favorites to get to know you a little bit better. We'll okay. put 30 seconds on the clock. Uh -oh. This is the first thing that comes to mind. How did Pete do? How did Pete do? I'm, I Pete, wanna beat him. Pete was really good. I, I don't know how quite you beat him. I guess it would be getting more in. So let, let's, okay, let's, let's, do it. let's, let's try to do this. Okay, uh, here we go. Ready? Uh, what is your favorite TV show? Um, Game of Thrones. Favorite book? Uh, End of the Affair by Graham Greene. What is your favorite musician or band? Guns N' Roses. What is your favorite uh, place to relax? Um, my apartment. Who is your role model? Um, Stephanie Cutter. What is your favorite sports team? Bengals, who day representing them with my bracelet today. There they are. Uh, we saw you last year, or earlier this year, <laughs> at the Super Bowl. There you are with Cincinnati Mayor Aftab Purval, who, who you were uh, helping out during that week. Uh, lots of great swag there. What is your prediction for the Bengals this season? Well, I think they're gonna, they're gonna go all the way. And I think that they win the Super Bowl by three with a walk-off win delivered by their ice-cold kicker, Evan McPherson. Mm. Mm hmm. You're giving love to the kicker, not to Joe, Joe Burrows. The, the, no, you know what, they, Evan delivered a lot of those playoff wins, so I, I, I'm, it's all in his hands, this, or I guess all in his feet this year, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, a, uh, we love the Bengals, but a reminder of who actually won the Super Bowl last All right. year, Let, of course, is the Los Angeles Rams. So we love to play music on the show. We're going to go out with I Love L.A., a reminder <laughs> of the actual Super Bowl champion, the Los Angeles Rams, hoping to repeat this year. We'll see what happens this year. Uh, but much like uh, Liz, the, the Bengals are scrappy and young and fun and exciting kind of like any given Tuesday. And talented and brilliant. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Great to see you, Liz. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. Go buy it. We'll be back with the tribute to Vince Scully when we come back.